so good day, good afternoon, good morning for everybody and uh, for faculty uh, panel and for all participants. So let me thank all of you for joining us today online in this very difficult and interesting circumstances we're facing all. And on behalf of the panel, I wish you and your families, of course, and your friends and colleagues continued health and safety. And I would also wish to thank Secretariat for organizing this meeting in this uh, challenging uh, environment. So this panel is a joint initiative officially launched on 2nd March 2020 by the President of the General Assembly and the Economic and Social Council with a view to enhance the financing for the Sustainable Development Goals. So mobilizing sufficient resources and particularly domestic resources for implementing the 2030 Agenda uh, and is, as you all know, a major challenge. And there is no doubt that this challenge will be increased by the current economic downturn and financial turmoil we are already in. However, we are convinced that the only way to, for, to go forward is to remain committed to global cooperation between governments, among governments, the private sector and civil society in support of sustainable development. In fact, the work of the panel is especially important now. It was not seen before as, as in this way, as a response to the crisis uh, in many countries. Uh, there is a phenomenon of loosening their rules and a situation that criminal, organized criminals group and corrupt government officials might be willing and tempting to exploit the consolidate illicit wealth and power. And there are already stories of rampant corruption and profiteering as reported by media and civil society organizations already. This is why we need to ramp up our collective global effort to enhance financial accountability, transparency and integrity. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the panel, panel's third virtual consultations and the first one with experts on the three clusters that the panel has agreed to focus on. Let me briefly update you on highlights of the panel's work since the launch. So despite re restrictions on international travel and meetings, we decided to do our work uh, via uh, video conferences and panel has already started. On 31st of March, uh, the full panel held its first video conference with all members attending. The panel was reviewed, re reviewed the background paper prepared by the Secretariat, which is available on the panel's website. The paper provides overview of existing international framework related to the financial integrity analysis and cross-cutting issues and recommendations of topics for possible future coordination by the panel. On that occasion, the panel agreed to split up the work into three clusters, three groups. First, improving cooperation in tax matters. Second, accountability, public reporting and anti-corruption measures. And third group and cluster, cooperation and settling disputes. And of course, the cluster leads were also agreed. The panel has also started to engage with the stakeholders. We met with the member states on the April 24th and with civil society two days ago. The panel will continue with an open and transparent approach to its work. Indeed, for the panel to make actionable recommendations, we need to engage regularly with all stakeholders. The panel is likely to complete its full interim report in September and its final report by February 21. The panel has convened this experts consultation today as we want to hear what you view as the priority action for promoting accountability and transparency and enhancing the global fight against corruption. All your inputs will feed into the interim report of, the pa of, the, of our paper and panel's work and I thank you all advan in advance for your contributions. So please know that the meeting will be recorded and posted online in next few days. At this time, I would like to pass the floor to Susan Rose Ackerman, fact panel cluster coordinator, who will pro provide us with an overview of the approach of this cluster. So Susan, please start. Susan, you're still on mute, unfortunately. 
I'm going to unmute you. There you go. Now oh, you're ready oh, to go. Okay. Sorry. I was clicking the wrong thing. Okay. Um, so um, welcome to everybody. I was noticing how many people are signed up. So I will try to be uh, fairly quick. Um, our idea for this meeting is to learn from those of you who are out here in the, in the atmosphere, uh, what are the most important things we should be uh, focusing on in this, in this cluster? And that, that means not what are the most important problems in the world, but what are the most, what are problems that can be dealt with um, internationally that are not being dealt with very well by the institutions that currently exist? Um, can those institutions take on a, a bigger role? Um, should there be other things that should be done that are, that are, that are key? So I'm thinking here of all the institutions you know about, the, uh, the um, United Nations uh, 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 Convention Against uh, Corruption, uh, the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, the Financial Action Task Force, um, the OECD uh, convention, uh, convention itself, um, and uh, the uh, efforts by the African Union particularly, uh, and to some extent by the OAS and the uh, International American Development Bank, and of course the other, both the World Bank and the regional uh, development banks that I'm sure uh, so most of you know about. Um, so uh, they're trying to, all trying to do various things in this cluster, um, but uh, what do you think works? What do you think uh, is really, doesn't make any sense at all, and they shouldn't worry much more about it, and so forth. Um, there's a lot of issues having to do with transparency. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the Extractive Industries Transparency um, Initiative, uh, you know, set up a few, a few, a few years ago. Um, and are there other, other things like that that would be, that would be, that would be helpful um, with respect to anti-corruption, anti-money laundering, other, other problems of financial, financial flows. Um, um, do we have evaluations? Uh, certainly the issue of beneficial ownership is in this category. Uh, are there any good, uh, evaluations of the, the attempts by some countries to actually um, um, uh, deal with this, deal with this question? Um, for example, the UK uh, case, which I think has some, some weaknesses as far as I know. Um, so it's, it's trying to learn from you, um, which things that are already being done seem to work and need to be supported? And what are the things that are not particularly with respect to helping the sustain sustainable development goals? In other words, not generally all around the world, but things that will particularly have an implications for, for, for pro low income countries. Is, is that speak the the yeah. Hello? Oh, no. Hello? <laughs> yes. Are you there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, 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 I'm Heidi Wichorek. Uh, uh, am I in the in the meeting now? Is it? Yeah. Yes. I guess yes, so. yes. 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 Right. You're in, you're in the meeting, and I'm making a few introductory remarks to get. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, please. Thank you. No, <laughs> not a problem. No problem. Um, so, um, um, what do we know about asset recovery? One thing on our agenda. There yeah. have been some. There have been in der Leiste. There, just, so a reminder there. that we can ask all to mute their microphones when they're not speaking, please. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. What, what do we know about, uh, have you studied the cases of trying to um, recover, uh, recover assets? Um, I know something about the Chad Cameroon uh, case, which is was not a success, but was a, I think, an interesting effort to be to be learned more uh, more from. Um, there's there was there's been proposals were have long been proposals for the World Bank and perhaps the UN to be something like a knowledge bank, and um, that seemed to me worth uh, something we should we should think about. Uh, we've got you know almost 200 countries out there who have tried all kinds of different things. In these areas, are there things that where countries can learn can learn uh, from each other? Um, is there's any kind of sort of benchmarking exercises that could be could be gone through? Um, so um, so I guess I I um, hope that uh, the ideas that we can learn from you something some things that we should be uh, focusing on because there's a huge range of issues here 
um, and um, um, uh, some of the some things are more important than others. Some things are more possible to be dealt with than others, and particularly with respect to the, as I said, the sustainable development goals. Uh, for example, and I'll just close with that the the asset recovery uh, uh, issue is, of course, not just a question about sending money back to countries. It's about how that money gets spent. Is it spent to help uh, people who are of low income? Uh, does it take gender into account? Is it, is it, are the equitable aspects of that question of, of those transfers uh, thought through and how could they be, uh, how could they be managed if we didn't want to recommend moving in that direction? So I think I will just uh, stop and, and uh, I know there's a few people who are particularly signed up to speak and then I assume the rest of you, or many of you. Uh, Susan? Yes. We do you finished? Yes, I'm finished. Okay, thank you very much uh, because uh, your your view was a little bit stopped. So I would like, uh, before starting our consultations uh, further with the experts, I would like to uh, make some technical remarks now. Uh, before, uh, uh, we need to, to, to understand that uh, all our microphones need to be muted uh, if we are not speaking. And if you would like to take the floor, uh, please use the rise, rise hand uh, button in the Zoom app so the secretary can keep track and later will invite you. And also in case of loss of sound or video, just try to refresh the browser window or try to log out and reconnect the meeting again. So now uh, let's start um, to uh, the, our main part of the meeting. The first three interventions we already have agreed and after uh, them we will be able to have open dialogue for the registered people on our uh, with our secretary so first we have claudia escobar from the international integrity initiative so please uh, miss escobar you have the floor hello good morning or good afternoon to everyone thanks to the faculty team for inviting me to this panel in behalf of triple i i would like today to take advantage of this opportunity to share with you uh, my personal experience as a judge and my biggest concerns regarding the tools to fight corruption effectively. First, I would like to address the problem of corruption in the judiciaries, and then I will talk about the challenges to be an independent and impartial judge in a place where corruption is systemic. Uh, I am a former judge from Guatemala that was forced to leave my country five years ago after I exposed a case of grand corruption that involved high officials in the executive branch and in Congress, and a case that threatened the independence of the judiciary. When I was appointed as a judge, I was not prepared to face the levels of corruption I found in the judicial system, especially in my own court. I had to deal every day with clerks that were used to accept bribes or to request them to lawyers or their parties in the trials. When I denounced this wrongdoing, immediately I started receiving death threats. Then I realized that also there were lawyers that were extremely corrupt, and some of them were also involved with drug dealers and used the judicial system on their own favor. I can give you many examples, but we don't have the time, and this is not the purpose of this talk. But, you know, I was also threatened by these lawyers who wanted to harm me. Uh, corruption promotes and generates impunity. In the early 2000s, the levels of impunity in my country was about 98%. So I can say and assure that it was the paradise for any criminal groups. And this is how the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala was created. You probably know about CICIG, how this effort was able you know, to uh, show the levels of corruption in the country. And there were many investigations against high-level officials in every branch and different sectors were uh, exposed to levels of corruption. But another problem in Guatemala is the weakness of the judicial system and the influence of politicians and powerful sectors over the judges. The system is designed for the judges that are impartial or independent to be punished and only the ones that are willing to cooperate with politicians will be promoted to higher courts. Judges in lower courts have some level of stability in their positions, but judges in the courts of appeals or the ones in the Supreme Court are elected by Congress every five years. 
This allows the Congress to decide every five years who are the ones who are going to be magistrates in the higher courts. When we talk about corruption, we have to understand that it is much more complex than simple bribery. Corruption is used by international crime to guarantee impunity of their crimes. Organized crime and other illegal networks uh, use corruption as a way to get away with their illicit activities. Take, for example, the case of Odebrecht that affected every country in Latin America. How many rulings have been issued against them? Besides the case of Brazil, the rest of the country were not able to prosecute them effectively because there are many gaps in the criminal procedures. We cannot ignore that corruption has an international dimension. That is why I think that international effort needs to be created to address this problem. The fight against corruption is, for me, totally asymmetrical. It is impossible to pretend that a judicial system of a, of a small or undeveloped country that does not have the resources will tackle corruption successfully. Corruption is nourished by different powerful networks that have endless economical resources. Meanwhile, the judiciary in some places are extremely weak and do not have the tools and the capacity to fight corruption. In places where corruption is systemic, where politicians become millionaires after holding power, where drug dealers are represented in Congress, and are able to elect judges in higher courts, it is unthinkable to expect a real fight against corruption. So let's talk about the independence of the judiciary, which is key for the rule of law. There are some international standards for the independence of judges. They must be independent from the executive and legislative branch of power. This is a basic principle of, of the rule of law. Some characteristics of of the independent judiciary as are to be impartial, to approach cases in an unbiased manner, display no prejudice, be politically independent, and operate without fear. But some countries in Latin America are extremely violent, and in other places of the world too. But when we talk about Latin America, especially the ones in the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, how can the judiciary be independent when the judges are influenced by political uh, groups or powerful in legal networks or when, or when judges and their family are subject to threats from corruption networks. In these places, the risk is real. That is why, without the backup of an international organization that can act independent from the powerful corrupt networks, it is impossible to tackle corruption. In most of these places, the legal, the legal framework is formally in place. We have the laws, we have the instruments, but corruption is not a matter of lack of legislation. It is a problem of weak institutions and lack of separation of power, but it's especially a problem of judicial independence. So that is why I really think that we need to consider international tools to fight corruption, to evaluate, you know, how feasible or how convenient is the creation of international prosecutors, international courts against corruption, and international commissions that can help um, the region or these countries to really uh, tackle corruption. So I will leave it like uh, here to, to hear the opinions of the other participants. Okay, thank you very much. I, I, I was a president, so I know what you're talking about. Uh, for me, it was not easy also, uh, because I found an experience that uh, politicians uh, very willingly uh, was somehow uh, influencing the judiciary uh, with pleasure. And it was not easy to fight it back and to, to persuade the judiciary that they need to work uh, independently. It was not also easy because they were a little bit afraid of it. So, but but it is possible. But I understand your proposal, and it's not the first uh, proposal from uh, uh, you. We got it uh, before about international bodies. Uh, but of course, we also know that some countries immediately, or United Nations countries, reacted very negatively because they don't want uh, interventions, and especially the countries where the corruption is a very high level. But we will, of course. Uh, uh, tackle this question very much in, in our panel's documents. So, uh, second uh, person, we have a um, second also independent uh, expert, Juanita Olay, and uh, she is anti corruption consultant. So, welcome, please, Juanita, take the floor. Uh, 
Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Fakti, for the invitation to participate in this panel and to contribute. I know the time is brief, so I will browse through a number of things that I will mention very brief briefly, and I hope to be able to elaborate on them if you have questions. Um, I, would, I would build on what, uh, what uh, has just previously said for, at the national level and bring it to the international level. And say, broadly speaking, that I, I believe from my perspective, much of the difficulties in fighting corruption currently at the international level come from a big gap between the systems that we have in place, which are prepared and ready for, for a world that no longer exists, and the world that we have today, which is a difference that I believe also is being further accelerated by the current situation with the COVID-19. Um, in that gap and within that range, uh, issues like cooperation, collaboration, agility and integration are much needed than ever. However, I don't think that the solution necessarily has to go through creating new structures or creating more bureaucracy or burdening uh, the old system with similar old structures. And I'll explain a little bit why. Let me address quickly uh, uh, Susan Rose Ackerman's questions on the points where I feel we're not really being good at. Um, you've heard also already these days and in the consultations that just, just started some of the main areas that require work. And I will also mention them briefly, but, but I would add to those. Um, international crime... it wouldn't have been better. Um, one of the issues where we cooperation and very agile cooperation more than ever is definitely the beneficial ownership registers and in fighting tax havens. But this also needs to be done with a different perspective than we've done until now, because we cannot rely only on governmental willingness to take part of those registers and to run them with the necessary transparency and openness or with the necessary da data standards that we need for them to work. So we need to come across or come back with new forms of collaboration and cooperation to, to make those work. We also need uh, 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 agile and creative and better in uh, collaboration among enforcement agents and informants agencies. Um, however, that is very difficult as we see each and every day, even, even the, despite the fact there's also successful cases, some of them recently, um, but that collaboration is still very cumbersome, still very difficult. It still, it still goes through the executive in many cases and makes making it very, very, very slow. We need uh, incredible, collaboration to set up effective whistleblower protection mechanisms internationally. They cannot be done nationally. This has to be across the board so that that protection can be effective and the standard can be high enough. We need to deal with the type of crime we have right now as we have it. There's a lot of repeat offenders and, 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 and I would mention quite a few, but a few companies come to mind like Halliburton or Bechtel that, you know, repeatedly um, have been going through investigation and um, it just happens again and again. We need to be, have systems that re deal better with repeat offenders. I don't think particularly that ideas like creating a separate international anti-corruption court would work, among others, uh, because that's not the solution appropriate to the type of crime we have today. There's, uh, and there's a lot of arguments uh, running around, but I, don't th I think that, that would have been a great solution for 20, 30, 30 years ago, but not for the type of corruption we have today. It's not, would not, in my view, would not be fit for the type of crimes we have and the biggest problem we have at the moment. There's better ways to deal with it. And there's also other international solutions that can be used to, 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 to deal with it. Parallel to cooperation in an agile and effective way, I think integration is also necessary. We've been working in silos. We have divided issues that are not, not, not really separated to be able to deal with them. And although it, this was useful in the past, I think it's no longer useful. Um, the, among those issues are human rights, business and human rights, climate change, environmental damage, uh, and corruption. If we, if we are able to deal with the complexity of 
looking at things together, looking at the interconnections that are among them, we are going to be able to deal not only with crime, but with some of the challenges facing many of those um, quite better. Among the issues that would, we would be better at dealing with are the collective damages and the reparation and the damage that corruption causes and the victim's reparation, which is in a way uh, one of the topics that Susan was mentioning concerning concretely asset recovery. Uh, the Dealing with the consequences of corruption uh, internationally and nationally is a point that we need to deal with up front. Otherwise, we will not change also our mindsets and the mindsets of the new generations uh, about corruption. And also because as long as the citizens keep suffering with the consequences of corruption and they won't be addressed, we won't, it, it won't make sense uh, it, the, the fight of corruption will not have enough energy and support from the citizens to be dealt with as it needs to, to be done. The other biggest challenge we have, and, and something the international system is not being really good at, is dealing at the dilemma of our day, which is uh, there's no good versus bad. Uh, and the same pipelines that are used for legal business are also used for illegal business. Uh, our systems are prepared for, for, for polarity, but not for, that, for those shades of gray. And we need to, 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 to look for ways to better address those shades of gray, and particularly on how the legal systems are abused uh, for illegal business. And this, this, this meets uh, illicit financial flows, money laundering, um, but also other aspects of international trade. Um, for example, uh, international arbitration is a very commonly used mechanism to enforce uh, corrupt agreements in the shadow of, of, of secrecy and privacy that many of those private international anti-corruption courts provide for uh, companies and, and governments. Um, we also need to deal with the other layers of complexity that come into international crime today as we know it. Among them, uh, the role of subcontractors, uh, lawyers, accountants, etc. So those are many of the cracks um, that 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 we have, and I've just mentioned very broadly. So to come back also to the to the to the main point, I think there is there is a big bag, big gap in our international system, and because, partly because that international system is thought for a world that no longer exists. One big uh, limitation, which the practicality of or your mandate may not be, make it realistic to address, is the fact that uh, uh, companies and non-state actors are not subjects of international law. Uh, that is not, that doesn't make sense in the world of today. Um, but how do we solve that problem? How do we change that? Is, is, is a difficult question that I know maybe beyond, beyond the, the, the mandate that you have. But, uh, but uh, um, I, my, my invitation is, uh, this is, a, is an in, incredible chance to look for creative solutions that fall a little bit away from the, 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 the tools and the approaches we have dealt with in the past. Um, and in order to overcome these limitations, I think we do need to be um, more creative. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Of course, uh, when we know that it is very difficult and complex and some things probably will be blocked by some member states, uh, but uh, we will try to do the best and at least raise the questions and make and became a little bit irritating for bad guys. Uh, so next speaker uh, will be the Mr. Messick. He also anti-corruption independent expert consultant. So please, you have your floor. Oh, well, thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and thank you all for participating in this. I'd like to make two points that uh, come out of the work I've been doing for NGOs on corruption. Point number one is the need to strengthen the uh, ability of victims of corruption to bring lawsuits to recover damages they've suffered as a result of corrupt acts. And point number two, picking up on uh, one that Professor Rose Ackerman mentioned, is the need 
to address um, how asset, stolen assets are returned to victim countries and the oversight mechanisms by which we ensure they're not again stolen. The damage suit issue, um, Article 35 of UNCAC gives those injured by corruption a right to recover damages. We all agree that uh, enforcement of anti-corruption laws is lacking. Prosecutors are hindered by political obstacles, sometimes fear of their life, courts are weak. Victims could be another way of enforcing the anti-corruption law. If someone is injured as a result of a corrupt act, for example, in Mozambique, where thanks to corruption by the part of two large companies and several executives of those companies and officials of the government, the people of Mozambique, one of the 10 poorest countries in the world, have suffered billions of dollars in damages, lack of access to health care, clean water, pensions have been denied because it's almost bankrupted the country. Not a single one of those people injured has filed a lawsuit for damages because there are obstacles, both to filing in Mozambique and in the countries where the wrongdoers are um, found. Why is that? I have been able to find not a single lawsuit around the world where a victim of a corruption has been able to recover damages despite the clear statement of that rule in Article 35 of UNCAC. So I would urge that be addressed. The second issue I think needs to really be strengthened is the question of asset recovery. We have seen in a couple of cases in Central Asian countries where once the assets, stolen assets were returned, they were used to strengthen the party that had a grip on power. And uh, in some sense, the assets were corruptly stolen again. We need better oversight, more involvement by civil society. The Nigerian uh, rec uh, civil society groups, along with the Nigerian government, and the return of the second tranche of money stolen by uh, Sani Abacha, I think offers an example that ought to be copied in many countries. The uh, immediate and direct and continuing involvement of civil society to ensure the money's not stolen again. And to, goes also to the larger question of transparency, because as civil society works through how to ensure the several hundred million dollars of Abacha money that Switzerland returned is not again stolen, that's forcing the government and its public financial management systems and those of its states to operate in a more transparent manner. So it's not just a focus on a couple of hundred million dollars, as important as that is, but if we get a focus on uh, better uh, ways of ensuring assets that are returned aren't stolen, we'll broaden and strengthen the entire way in which the public budget of country, developing countries, of any country where assets are returned, are managed. So I would just again point to the need to see victims able to bring lawsuits when they've been injured by corrupt actions and the need to ensure better oversight and continuing oversight of stolen assets. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now I'd like uh, to go and open the floor to the faculty panel yeah. uh, members to respond and would like to start with the Susan if she has something to say. Please Susan, if you would like to start. Please unmute yourself. Yes, I just did. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I'll just I, thank you for those for those for those comments. Uh, some of them I think are things we should really uh, take up. Um, but I think I'll I would rather just hear from others uh, right now. Thank you. So uh, can I start, uh, Susan? Uh, you can hear me. Yes, yeah, help us uh, to manage. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, Mr. Ahmed, if you would like to speak, please raise yeah. your hand. Uh, oh, in, uh, yeah, the, in in the so I've got a couple people before that. Uh, so first, we were going to see if any of the other 
um, faculty panel members were ready to speak uh, if they wanted to respond to any of the comments. Uh, so I can, uh, maybe Mr. Stelzer, was that your hand raised or just adjusting the camera? No, okay. <laughs> um, there is no panel, panel okay. to participate. Okay, if there is no, thank you colleagues. We're still in listening mood. And uh, I suggest to go to the open discussion so that our interventions, uh, I will ask to be short enough to uh, feed into the uh, amount of time we have for later, maybe for our panel members to respond. So, and I want also to remind again that if you like to take a floor, you indicate raising the button for secretariat to be able to uh, look after you. And at this stage, I would like already to give the floor to Peter because already I hope he has a list of uh, participants to talk. I do indeed. So I can see the uh, many raised hands now. So I had um, a couple who had already raised their hand. So I will come to them first and I will do them in groups of three just so people are aware. Um, so I had uh, Mr. Sonsen, uh, Mr. Granikas, Carlos Granikas, and then Mr. Nardi. So uh, thank Mr. Sonsen, please go ahead. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Ma um, Madam President. I'll keep this short. One of the things that I've not heard about, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the International Bar Association, is the enormous power of the private sector. And with the right incentives and the right enforcement and the right cooperation, a great deal can be done by the private sector. I'm very happy to see that Patrick Mouet here is from here from the OECD. Hello, Patrick. Uh, and uh, Tina and Abiola, uh, who've worked hard at the OECD projects to uh, investigate what's being done around the world. Um, the private sector has a lot to offer. When the hand comes out, it's pointed at us. We have a lot of people on the ground. We have a lot of capacity. And I urge you to think about the right incentives to get the private sector involved in addressing these problems. I know uh, the last thing I'll say is that there's a great deal of work uh, precisely on this point being done at the OECD, and I recommend it to you. Thank you, Mr. Somsen. Uh, so next we had Mr. Granikas, I believe from the Open Con Contracting Initiative. Yes, that's true. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, uh, President. So my name is Carolis. I work for the Open Contracting for Partnership. It's an expert organization bringing open data and open government together to make sure public money is spent openly, fairly, and efficiently and we focus on public procurement that's precisely what i want to bring uh, to our attention so public procurement is number one corruption risk worldwide around 60 percent of bribes within the oecd countries are paid for government contracts and this has been particularly evident during the uh, the recent crisis of covid 19 where a number of scandals show just how fragile procurement can be but also how vital it is to the delivery of goods and services. So in that light, the guidance and UN Convention Against Corruption review process feel just a little out of date as technology and, and new approaches, including open data, civic monitoring, um, are drastically transforming how we can control those risks. And there are already good examples. In other words, technology allows us to do so much more than we are actually doing right now. So the question is, I was very curious to hear about the, um, the appetite amongst the faculty uh, members to first of all highlight procurement as a strategic priority and second, look at best practices and celebrate the new normal approaches, including open contracting. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then I had next on my list, Mr. Claudio Nardi. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Wichtenstein's negotiator for the ANGAS outcome document. For us, um, ANCAC provides a global legal framework um, to fight corruption. Uh, the, the convention is a true success for you know, collective efforts to strengthen the rule of law and effectively fight corruption. Liechtenstein is fully committed to the implementation of ANCAC and supports its implementation review mechanism. The mechanism has shown good results and encouraging outcomes. Its review provides an excellent basis for domestic discussions 
on measures to implement the recommendations. In our case, we have made significant progress in responding to several recommendations, also identified in the final peer review report. The preventive measures set out in the 4CU anti-money laundering directive have been implemented into Liechtenstein law. As part of the implementation of the directive, Liechtenstein has established a register of beneficial ownership. The Financial Market Authority's AML CFTO side system has been completely reorganized and strengthened since our last ANCAC review. And we revised our law on the payment of contributions to political parties. The amended law specifies the legal framework um, for a universe uniform procedural treatment of political parties and enhances the transparency of party funding. Liechtenstein has furthermore successfully engaged in the recovery and return of stolen assets and returned more than 230 million US dollars. The provisions of ANCAC regulating the recovery and return of stolen assets are very diligently crafted. They provide a sound legal framework for international cooperation. By mixing up the concept of asset return under ANCAC with other forms of international cooperation, in particular with the concept of illicit financial flows, we risk to undermine the strength and the success of the Convention, which resides in the clear application of its terms to stolen assets. Let me assure you that we will continue to engage in preserving the integrity of the Convention and will oppose to any efforts to undermine the Convention or its instruments, including from the panel. The panel must clearly commit to operate within the defined legal framework of ANCAC and acknowledge um, the work and outcomes of the Conference of States Parties. The work of the panel should respect the commitment to and be based on the terms of uh, GA Resolution 74206. Concepts that have proven to be non-consensual in the framework of these discussions will not become more consensual through the work of the panel. Quite the contrary. There is a clear risk that we lose important agreements by consensus. This uh, would be an unfortunate contribution by the panel, in particular in light of the upcoming GA special session on corruption. We expect the panel to respect the responsibilities of international bodies and not duplicate, interfere or undermine with their mandates. Even more so, the panel should not preempt outcomes of UN mandated processes, in particular the special session on corruption. We have high expectations in the special session as a way to make decisive progress in implementing the SDGs, in particular SDG 16, through which we have all committed to the fight against corruption. In this context, there is a legitimate discussion to be held on how to improve accountability for large-scale corruption including from an institutional point of view. By preempting any such discussion, the panel will do a disservice to the aim of an ambitious outcome of the special session. I thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I can remind um, everybody participating, we don't have that much time, so please try to keep your interventions short um, and please try not to read long statements. Uh, so, uh, to, in interest of some gender balance, since we just had three men speak, um, I have on my list Alejandra Quevedo um, and Suad, uh, so I'll take them because we've just had a number of men. Um, and then I think I also saw Abiola Makinwa, so I will also take her third to give us some balance. So uh, please, Alejandra. Uh, good. Good day, everyone. My name is Alejandra Quevedo, and I'm an anti-money anti con consultant uh, for governments. Particularly, I've, my, the focus of my work is to help countries to comply with the FATF uh, standards for, uh, in implementation of those uh, standards uh, for two recommendations. And what we have seen and the relationship with the corruption is the lack of uh, risk assessment. So countries are required to uh, assess the risk of money laundering and terrorist financing and in doing so they, they should also assess where uh, 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 in relation to the predicate offenses and one of those is corruptions. So what we have seen is uh, there is a lack of assessment and uh, how uh, 
the money is being laundered, basically. How the, how the money from, uh, coming from corruption, the illicit uh, money, the gains from corruption are being laundered in the countries. Whether it is in the same country with the, uh, with the predicate is, is uh, committed, uh, or whether the, the, the launder happens abroad, Etc. And what ways and in which ways the money is being laundered? Is it by the use of the real estate? Is it by the use of accountant? Is it by the use of the financial sector? Etc. So, so I think it's important in the in the for the for the review of the panels. What are the tools? What are the mechanisms for countries to assess their own risk of corruption and also in relation to more to money laundering? Also, I would like to echo some of the comments in relation to the private sector. Uh, the FATF standards uh, have a number of uh, a number of recommendations that countries should uh, require to financial institutions and non-financial institutions uh, specific uh, requirements to identification customer record keeping and particularly a report of suspicious transactions. In the reporting of su suspicious transactions, it includes. Uh, the predicate offenses as such as corruption. So it is important to highlight the role of the private sector in reporting suspicious transactions and how they can and should enhance uh, the, the, mo the monitoring and the compliance of these, uh, the, mon uh, the programs of for compliance with these requirements to uh, help them to keep identifying the suspicious transactions with regards to corruptions. And then uh, I would also like to highlight the role of the uh, corporate corporations and coordination interagencies uh, between law enforcement and anti-corruption agencies. Often happens that uh, law enforcement and anti-corruption agencies work in isolation and they don't share information. There is no uh, mechanism in place. So those agencies, law enforcement that, uh, that are in charge of leading the investigations and then later prosecute, they, they are not in contact with uh, anti-corruption agencies that in some cases lead policy, uh, lead uh, different uh, studies, lead the, the, different, the, the different approaches to corruption in, 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 the, in the specific countries. And finally, I would like to add the importance to raise awareness and education in the, in the community to the uh, exposure that uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a business, as an entrepreneur, all face uh, uh, to be exposed to corruption. So it's important to highlight the, the role that, 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 that we or the panel may have with regards to educate, educating the, the community in the exposure that uh, they, 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 the community may face uh, with regards to corruption. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I now had Suad on my list. Suad, are you there and available? Yes, I am, Peter. Great, please go ahead. Oh, yes, good afternoon. I am Suad Aden Osman, the Executive Director of the Coalition for Dialogue on Africa that serves also as a Secretariat to the African Union High Level Panel on Illicit Financial Flows. Uh, I just, I, I am pleased to see that uh, the members of the High Level Panel, Irene, um, and uh, Prof. Bolaji are actually uh, also members of the FACTI, so I am very comfortable that uh, the work that has been done on the continent will be conveyed, because we, we seem to have been advancing more than the rest of the world have done as a group, as, an, as a union and as a, uh, for, uh, for, the, for the benefit of the continent. Uh, I'm sure most of you are aware that uh, there has been an African Union uh, Heads of State Assembly decision uh, lately, um, that was one of the outcomes of the annual uh, theme on winning the fight against corruption. That was the the passing of uh, of a policy and advocacy tool to strengthen the combat on, of IFFs. Um, that was the uh, the Common African Position on Asset Recovery and Return. And uh, I just wanted to, to intervene because I'm sure that uh, the work on that part will be continuing and we will, we will probably engage the FACTI as a group as well as a continent. Uh, but we, I, I am a bit concerned at the number of, of speakers before me 
who keep emphasizing that it is important to put in place a system to, to see through how they recover the assets when they go back to the countries where they were stolen from are actually spent well. I think that we have to be very careful and make a difference between these two things. Uh, when, we, when these assets were stolen and made their way where they are now frozen and held, uh, those standards were not necessarily applied. Uh, they, 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 they were, there is something, a global financial architecture that helps these, uh, this is not pocket money that leaves at least as far as my continent is concerned that leaves the continent and when they land there the language that goes that we are hearing often that says that when it's returned it will be looted again well make sure that it doesn't come back the same place too because the, uh, the problem is that it is going somewhere most of this time because when we're talking about recovery we're not talking about corruption that remains within we're talking about something that went offshore so it's about landing and, and anything that is happening in foreign jurisdictions when they know where the money is coming from the first place, but then pulling those uh, standards only when it's about time to return it. Most of the time they even have lesser problem in evicting the person and then recovering from a criminal, from a criminal. But then the return part of it is facing the whole standards that should have been pulled also when it was coming. So we are very concerned and as you will notice of the 38 recommendations that were made by the Tabombeki panel, uh, one of them was that these resources the management of frozen assets, for example, is also a major problem for our continent because the, during the period of litigation, this money is, is being held by the same banks that were culprits. And this, they have been accepting this money without pulling any standards. These, these banks are in jurisdiction, so these countries should be. Uh, I don't know how many of you were in the discussion, the high level uh, uh, session uh, during the last uh, General Assembly uh, in, uh, in New York, but uh, one of the Sons of Africa uh, that is highly regarded on this side actually floated the idea that we should be getting into naming and shaming if countries that are supposed to return uh, assets are not really collaborating because at the end of the day we cannot only say you're corrupt because that is entertaining the same narrative we've been hearing you're corrupt so multinational come with the idea that they're going to deal with corrupt corrupt uh, uh, officials they don't have a behavior or an attitude that, that will be the standards that will be applied where they come from but when they land on the other side and the money gets here, now we are pulling all sorts of standards and we have all sorts of narratives that are there. So uh, I was just uh, throwing this because we will be submitting a number of things. And as far as uh, the African, African Union is concerned, we have uh, this uh, advocacy and policy tool that was already to strengthen the combat in, against illicit financial flows. So it is part of that, um, that uh, of that work plan, uh, would, we would say, uh, the engine to fight illicit financial flows from the continent. But we are paying attention and putting a priority on asset recovery and return. I would just leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suad. Uh, so now I have um, Abiola Makinwa. Go ahead, Abiola. Sorry, you're still on mute. There you go. Thank you. Now, thank you for having me. I'd like to make my contribution in a, slight, a slightly different area. And I think um, Peter has already touched on it. And this is I'm going to array to raise awareness about the possibilities to find and prevent this. We focus on punishment and returning assets and so on and so forth. Um, if we look at changing behavior, Preventing acts of corruption from occurring in the first place. This is a new document that must provide an effective response to the opportunity and conflict and lack of political will that plague the punishment of separation. 
where traditional criminal justice processes are compromised. Abiola, we can't hear you. Abiola, you might um, close your video because the sound is breaking up when you're speaking. So uh, okay. as much as we'd like to see you, it's probably even better if we hear you clearly. Okay, can you hear me now? That's better, thank you. All right, so well, I'll just quickly summarize. I think we need to explore the path, pathways to governance that exist in the prevention space. We focus on the return of assets, but where the criminal justice processes are compromised, this tends to be, a, I think, a rather ineffective strategy. Now, Article 39 of RCAC speaks to public-private cooperation as a strategy in anti-corruption enforcement. Article 39 encourages collaboration between prosecuting authorities and offenders. It encourages self-reporting and it also um, speaks to um, encouraging uh, companies, for example, to put in place management systems that prevent acts of corruption from occurring at all. So I think this is one area where we need to raise awareness and um, also focus more attention to this um, requirement of ONCAP. Secondly, um, there are many countries that are already taking this approach. So we have negotiated settlement systems springing up across different jurisdictions, different criminal um, countries with different um, criminal justice principles, and we have a fragmented landscape. So the work group of Ryan, Tina, Peter are, are very uh, aware of this. I'll try to see how we can have less fragmentation and more certainty, because this is becoming the primary mechanism for anti-bribery enforcement. Recently we had Airbus and then we had um, Royals Royce, we had Siemens, we have, we've had uh, uh, cases that we hear about and where we have seen effective anti-corruption enforcement have come out of this public-private cooperation process. Uh, just some more points very quickly. This has become the primary mechanism of anti-bribery enforcement which raises the question, where do the victims fit in? Now, if you look at the um, settlement regimes of countries like the UK and countries like the Netherlands, they have express provision for compensation in the settlement regime process to be made to um, victims. So, uh, for example, in the, in the UK, as part of the settlement um, in the Standard Bank case, um, um, we, Compensation was given to the government of Tanzania. At the World Bank Siemens um, settlement, they created an initiative, an integrity initiative. Well, Peter can say more about that, which essentially kicked off the collective, collective action framework. So here is the, again a very important space that still society, um, I, I think, can can explore in 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 bringing victims into this. It's what has become the primary mechanism of anti-corruption and. All of this goes to behavior. If you can change the way companies behave, you are changing, every, you're changing the actions of everyone within the sphere of influence. And one of the important um, um, standards that has come out, which is um, the ISO standard 37001, uh, um, a reflection on the standards that you will find in the FCPA um, resource guide, that you will find in the UK Bribery Guidelines, all of these. Uh, speak to um, the management systems that companies are now increasingly putting in place to prevent, detect, report acts of corruption that occur within that sphere of influence. And I think we need to raise awareness about these new paths to governance, which um, enable us to leverage the potential of another major actor. In, in you know in this whole corruption, in, especially that governments have been compromised by endemic corruption. Thank you. I hope you heard all of that. Yeah, that was much clearer once the video was off. Thank you. Um, right. So, uh, uh, Dr. Grabowski, uh, we are out of time, but with your indulgence, I might go a few minutes over to let the last people who've had their hands up speak. Yes, I think that it is interesting for us and it will be useful for us all to hear. So I had two panel members who wanted to speak. Um, and so I'm going to give them a very, sh uh, hopefully very brief, uh, like a minute or so to to speak before we go on to the um, the final 
four that I had on my list, and I'm not going to take new ones after these four, so okay. apologies. Um, so I had Teresa first. Teresa Watanagase. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, please, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Teresa Watanagase. I was formerly the uh, governor of the Central Bank of Thailand, and uh, currently I'm a member, well, I'm a director of the uh, uh, private sector coordination against uh, corruption, which is a private sector movement. And I would like to echo uh, the point uh, made by a few speakers, earlier speakers, that uh, uh, private sector participation in the anti-corruption is uh, very useful. It takes two to tangle, we all know that. And so, the, well, for the private sector, for financial institutions, uh, there are uh, international standards that uh, banks have to follow the AML CF2 standards. But uh, apart from banks, the uh, ordinary companies can play a big role as well. In our case, the, uh, this CAC movement uh, started to mobilize uh, participations of uh, starting from uh, major companies uh, to come out and make a declaration against corruption. And uh, later on, it's just, it was not just a, a, a declaration. We actually put in a process for uh, these companies to, have, uh, to announce their policy, to have the policy against corruption in place and have the procedures uh, you know, to deal with, to prevent the corruption. And uh, these uh, policies and procedures have to be uh, verified by an external uh, uh, auditor. And that has proven to be a very successful uh, uh, process to put in. And we are now moving on to uh, solicit the participation of the SMEs, uh, not just the big companies. And uh, for that, I think and, and the important point is that we need to have uh, funding to support uh, the private sector's movement as well, especially for, you know, the smaller guys who are not uh, very, uh, uh, who, who uh, may not have uh, as much uh, resources at the big firms. And uh, also, uh, uh, we need to educate, especially the younger generation, uh, you know, uh, so that going forward, because the older generation may be uh, useful, uh, sorry, maybe they're used to uh, the way the societies have been, uh, you know, showing them that uh, corruption is a uh, is more like a norm, and uh, they feel hopeless to do anything about it. And so, the education uh, for the uh, younger generation is uh, necessary, and that, of course, is going to take uh, uh, resources to do so. Thank you. Thank you. And then I also had, I had noted Irene that wanted to speak. Irene, please very quickly so we can get to the last few interventions and close. Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. All right. Thank you. I'll just list the points that, uh, that uh, for me were flagged by this conversation. Um, one of them is related to ISDS, uh, flagged by the second speaker, and its secrecy. The question of power in influence peddling, how does that link to the quest for transparency and ending corruption. Secondly, um, the current e efforts, I would request that all those who have referenced uh, existing efforts, um, if they could write in and send more information, but also evidence, um, evidence about the success of these uh, current measures, uh, particularly with re in relation to stemming and reducing the illicit flows that are, arise from corruption and other forms of illicit financial flows, um, you know, money laundering and so on. So if we could also have evidence about how successful these efforts are in terms of the reduction in the flows. Um, third and fourth point, the question of beneficial ownership was also flagged. Uh, how does this connect to legal ownership? So beneficial ownership by itself um, is, is very, it is very important, but taking that a step further to connect it to legal ownership is something that has been flagged by various uh, various literature and connecting it to the question of assets that was raised by, by one of the speakers, um, investment of uh, laundered funds, for example, in, in real estate and so on. So how would an asset register or registration of assets at national or international levels support 
uh, dealing with, uh, with corruption. And finally, the question that comes to my mind uh, in relation to the role of uh, multinationals, particularly as a part of the private sector, a powerful part of the private sector, is how about the issue of regulation of multinational corporations um, and the connection to, to investment, regulation of investors, uh, regulation of international taxation. How does this issue of corruption link to the offshore system? This is the question that was raised um, by, by Swad from CODA and a number of other speakers as well. How do we link that and how do we, uh, how do we bring transparency in the offshore system in order to deal with the international dimension of corruption and money laundering? Thank you. Okay, so I have um, four people who were on my list originally. Um, so I'm gonna go to them and we're gonna have to stop after that, unfortunately. Um, so I have Mr. Nasruddin Ahmed, Mr. Um, Kikinyunyu, uh, I think it's Mr. Molet, and then um, Ms. Frida. So if we can go, and if we do request that you be very brief um, in making your remarks. So Mr. Ahmed first. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. So, um, uh, I just, I, uh, my name is Ahmed Nasruddin Ahmed. Yeah, I worked for the Anti-Corruption Commission, Bangladesh. Now I teach at the university. So basically, I'll be focusing on two points, uh, which uh, some others have already covered one. Uh, this is a problem uh, not only for Bangladesh, many developing countries. This is trade-based money laundering uh, through over-invoicing of imports. So we had uh, we are undertaking a study and we have not finished, but we figured out that a lot of money is going outside the country. So and I was the chairman of the National Board of Revenue. So unless I know about uh, these things, how the some scrupulous business people and others are doing that in collusion with uh, uh, some customs and other officials. So the challenge uh, is that uh, so um, how to tackle that, how uh, so we need uh, global uh, support uh, to uh, prevent uh, the money going out of uh, the country. In the so this is the yeah, and the second and I, I would like to mention here that United Nations Convention Against Corruption (UNCAC) is the global document that uh, tells all these uh, prohibitions of how the money laundering can be checked. Uh, the issue of asset recovery, I'll be talking about then, second point. So the chapter 14 um, uh, deals with the International Corporation, Article 43, 49, and uh, chapter 5, Article 51 to 59. So that is also very important for Bangladesh. Second point, the, uh, the, uh, since the money is going out uh, from the country, so the question of uh, tracing the money uh, um, uh, freezing the forfeiting and, and the return of uh, the stolen asset. So I was the focal point of the Interpol uh, anti-corruption uh, efforts, and uh, and I visited a number of countries and uh, meetings, United Nations, different uh, forums. But we uh, we made request that we made the mutual legal assistance. That is a uh, for getting the information, to tracing the stolen asset. Unfortunately, we have got only one success story. We are very much thankful to that. And we utilized a small, this is simple $100,000 uh, we got and we used for uh, capacity building of the, our anti-corruption commission. But uh, unfortunately, we did not, most of the, almost all cases, we did not get the response from the from the mainly the developed countries, some countries, so they are not responding. They are telling their their legal system is uh, different, complex procedures, a uh, lot of uh, agencies are different, uh, coordination, other things are there. So it is their problem. So how uh, so? But the article um, fifty one to fifty nine of the ANCA that clearly spells out uh, the global um, uh, collaboration and cooperation for um, uh, helping uh, the, where the money has gone out. So actually, so we have, I take this opportunity to um, uh, request the secretary to take note of this because we have a lot of frustration uh, about this asset recovery 
and also the money London money is going outside. So that is my third point. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so I next have uh, Mr. Salamani Kinyunyu, and I, so I apologize. This is going to be a almost all male round, but we had an all female round before, so I think we're pretty balanced. Uh, Mr. Kinyunyu, for you, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Right. Uh, three quick points. Um, first, uh, my name is Salamani. I work for the African Union Advisory Board on Corruption. Um, we note that uh, the technical and legal processes that are involved in uh, asset recovery are unduly complex and lengthy, and we encourage that uh, measures be put in place to streamline and simplify these processes, and that also recovery should be encouraged through uh, political as well as diplomatic channels. Um, Suad has already referenced the point on uh, the management of returned assets, and uh, our position is that the management of returned assets should be unconditional and that decisions on their use should be left solely to the discretion of victim states. We believe it is immoral and unethical for receiving countries which often profit uh, from the interim management of these assets to determine how uh, assets should be used. And then finally, uh, we view corruption and illicit financial flows um, as being facilitated by a fundamentally unjust and distorted global financial architecture. These are very much uh, different sides of the same coin and we encourage consideration of these phenomena collectively and not separately. And we also call for, uh, to this end, reforms in uh, international tax rules, establish of beneficial ownership registers, country by country reporting, and the progressive abolishment of secrecy jurisdictions and tax havens. Thank you. Thank you. That was admirably concise. Uh, so we much appreciate that. Um, now I have Mr. Moulet. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I'll try to be concise as well. Um, the OECD, I'm the head of the anti-corruption division of OECD. The OECD stands ready to share its experience of 20 years of implementation of the anti-bribery convention, especially in the area of interest, as I saw from your panel report, very interesting document, um, in the area of anti-bribery enforcement, in particular non-trial resolutions, which is a new mode for solving cases of uh, corruption and bribery, but also uh, other issues like whistleblower protection, uh, peer reviews, a mechanism for peer reviews, and also working with the private sector. All areas we would like to share some experience with you. And uh, the, the, I have a question also. I was wondering whether there is a link between the work of this panel and the United uh, Nations General Assembly uh, Special Session on Corruption for next year. Thank you. Thank you. And then I had last uh, Ms. Freda. Uh, it says Freda's iPhone. Ms. Freda, you have the floor. Yes, I am at Frida Stuart Tamba. Oh, Alfreda, yes. Yeah, Liberia Revenue Authority and currently a member of the UN Committee of Tax Experts on International Tax Corporation. Briefly, with respect to beneficial ownership, I suggest that compliance with the minimum transparency standards recommended by the OECD or other standards to be agreed be included in the cooperation and lending conditionalities of the IMF, World Bank, IFC, and related institutions. This all institutions transparency approach, in my view, will help accelerate and maintain our compliance. Similarly, for and on or anti-corruption, I suggest the establishment of measurable benchmarks. Benchmarks be set in consultation with countries for improving the corruption index over a, a period. If they do not, then the same all of institutions approach discuss above could be applied. 
I strongly think that the United Nations should also be a cogent member of the all institutions approach by setting similar transparency benchmarks and develop a means for measuring, monitoring, and evaluating countries. The annual performance report derived therefrom could be one of the many publications made available at the annual General Assembly. That's it, giving the time. Thank you, Alfreda. Uh, much appreciated for you to be brief. Um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Grabowski, before I hand back to you, I had noted that two further panel members wanted to respond to some of the comments. So if we, if you will indulge those final two. Um, yes, that, I think so, I think so, yeah. <laughs> okay, that is Jose Antonio Ocampo and Thomas Stelzer. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I just wanted to make uh, a brief comment uh, on, on, the, on the following point. Uh, um, not, many, not many of you have uh, mentioned the issue of smuggling. Uh, but let me say that uh, from my own experience, I, I was, the, as the Minister of Finance, introduced the controls in the financial system against money laundering. And what we had at the same time was an increase in money laundering uh, through smuggling. Uh, in fact, um, smuggling uh, is the main mechanism through which uh, narco-trafficking money uh, is uh, laundered into Colombia. Uh, for that, and in turn, uh, that is a very closely related to, uh, a, a, to corruption because the corruption uh, of customs officials is one of the major problems uh, that we face. Uh, and therefore, this issue of smuggling should not be left out uh, from the agenda uh, of our uh, commission and a special recommendation for Susan in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Stelzer now. Thank you very much. I'm Thomas Stelzer, Dean of the International Anti-Corruption Academy. Thank you very much to all the participants for the informed and pertinent uh, contributions. Uh, I want to refer to the reference to the private sector, which is very well taken. I believe that uh, the panel can only discharge successfully of the complex mandate by ways of, an, of a comprehensive uh, process, including all the stakeholders, which we have been doing already uh, through this process of consultations of the last days. Thank you very much. So Dr. Grabowski, um, back to you. Okay, I understood that the final words will be given by my co-chair or I need to give him back the debt from last. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe he is online, so. Well, you, I, I, if you want to give that back the debt, I, I'm, I'm fully, I'm, I fully support no, no. you in that process. <laughs> yeah, let's leave it for next time. <laughs> Please, okay, uh, good. So, um, well, first, well, let me uh, thank you all for the very valuable inputs, which will evidently inform the panel's analysis as we advance our work. And by building on your support and active engagement, I'm convinced that we'll be able to present innovative and forward-looking solutions as we have been asked by February 2021. So let me try to provide a, a brief summary from the notes that I've taken. I have nine, ten points. Uh, the first thing I heard was the necessity to go towards creative solutions uh, because uh, uh, we need solutions which are adapted to the current reality, which is very different from the reality which existed 20, 20 years ago in, in fighting corruption. And uh, uh, point number two, uh, this is more necessary because of the complexity of the corruption layers that uh, do exist. I heard that uh, sentence. Uh, point number three, uh, uh, the issue of the necessity to strengthen the protection and the needs of the victims of corruption. Point number four, uh, how can the private sector uh, be looked at as a critical actor 
in uh, the solutions that are envisaged, not to miss that point, and Thomas Tetzel referred to that uh, just right now. Uh, point number five, look at procurement as a strategic priority. I think it's uh, well taken. Um, uh, point number uh, uh, six, uh, which was made on the online comments, uh, the necessity to address the issue of uh, uh, the role of independent journalism in fighting corruption. And uh, by the same time, an issue which was raised very early, raised very early, was the issue of the independence of the judiciary in a context of weak states and weak institutions. So when institutional quality is low, we need to really look at the question of the independence of the judiciary so that some kind of protection within an international context can be provided. And uh, the, uh, the point that was raised uh, by the, the African Union, the differentiation which were raised uh, between uh, the return, the process of return of stolen assets and the use of the assets internally and nationally. So that differentiation was highlighted as a, as a, as a, as a point which should be uh, clearly uh, uh, looked at and not to uh, create a confusion between the two, even if evidently uh, uh, the issues of corruption at national level are evidently important. So, uh, and the last two points by our panel members uh, regarding uh, 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 the, uh, the smuggling uh, uh, issue, which I know Minister Ocampo has been referring to uh, uh, several, a several number of, uh, of times, and the issue of private sector was still so mentioned, which uh, uh, will, uh, uh, we will be duly taken into account. So I think uh, these are the points that I have taken. I might have missed some of the points. So I, I uh, uh, my, even if my, and it is, will be, my, my synthesis is, is uh, incomplete, you will evidently uh, receive from the Secretariat a summary of our discussions, which will be more precise than what I presented. So I invite all of you to engage in the panel's uh, future activities. We sincerely believe that uh, your active participation will help us present proposals that will enable the global economic and financial systems to work better for everyone and everywhere. And like Madam President, um, co-chair was saying, uh, these are very critical times where uh, the issues we are dealing with uh, can be, uh, uh, can benefit uh, some actors in order to increase uh, uh, illicit financial flows and corruption. Uh, in troubled times, uh, these, uh, as she rightly mentioned, these behaviors can be increased. So uh, we need to be aware of that uh, in our deliberations and our work, and evidently we count on you, and you, on your expertise, uh, your, uh, your comments and your analysis. So I wish you and your loved ones continued health and success to all efforts to control the spread of COVID-19 and address the economic consequences of a pandemic. I thank you.